just make sure it's working here. Okay, for those joining us right now, it's on Facebook Live as well. Okay, so welcome to the Kabbalah of reopening the world or keeping it shut. Today I'm going to discuss this issue, analyze it. It's the issue on everybody's minds. It's the issue in all the news cycles to reopen the world or to keep it shut. What does the Kabbalah say about this? What can we as Jews learn from this? What's going on? So we start off with a little joke just to get uh, people in the mood here. Just going to check this. So, you know, there's this old monastery in Europe where there are monks who live there. But in order to get to this monastery, you have to go up hundreds of feet in a vertical cliff. You go up, 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 and you carry it in a basket in a bag. So these couple monks, they pull you up with ropes and you go up, 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 up. So one time there's this tourist going into this monastery to visit, to see what's going on. He goes up in this basket and in the middle he notices that the, that the, the, the rope is not very stable and it may tear. So he asks the monk over there, he said, tell me, Mr. Monk, how often do you change the rope? So the monk thinks, he thinks, he thinks, and he says, whenever it breaks. So a couple of years ago, I was giving a class, and in the middle of the class, let me just check this one second. In the middle of the class, this lady comes over to me. Her name is Edith. And Edith tells me she has, um, she remembers 47 years ago, her aunt had a stroke. And she went to visit her in the nursing home, in the rehabilitation center. Yeah, she went to visit her. And while she was there, she noticed a very young lady in her 20s who had an accident. And she goes over to her. She, she remembers she's a beautiful, beautiful lady. She goes over to this lady and she has a conversation with her and it turns out she was paralyzed from the neck down. She was totally incapacitated. Incapac she couldn't do anything by herself. She was relying on the nurses for every single piece that needed to be done. So she goes over to her and her mind was functioning 100%. And so she's so moved by this young lady, she asks her point blank, she says, why don't you cry? And this lady answers back a powerful, powerful statement. She says, if I cry, who will wipe away my tears? You see, if you ever look at an orphanage, you'll notice children over there are from homes with no parents. And you'll notice no tears. But go to any Jewish home and you'll notice the children are kvetching and crying the whole day long. It should be the other way around. In an orphanage, they should be crying. And in a home, they should be happy. They're parents. And the answer is, we cry when we think, when we see that somebody is there to collect our tears. You know, they tell the story of the Kotzke Rebbe. He had a very good friend, Rabbi Yitzchok of Vorki. And one time Rabbi Yitzchok of Vorki passed away. And his son, his child, you know, after 30 days, he got worried because he didn't see him in a dream, in a vision. His father with a great tzaddik would always appear to him. And Rabbi Yitzchok of Vorki never appeared to his son. So his son, Reb Mendel, went over to the Kotzke Rebbe, who was a very, very close and dear friend of Reb Yitzchak of Vorki. And he told him, you know, I haven't seen my father. Where is he? And um, the father, the, the Kotzke Rebbe said to him, you know, I was also worried that he didn't appear to me in a dream. My great friend, Reb Yitzchak of Vorki. And so what I did was I went over to Shemaim to heaven. And I got to this place where Rashi, the great sage Rashi was sitting and I said to Rashi, did you see my friend Rabbi Yitzchak of Varki? And Rashi said, I saw him, but he left. And so I went over to another beautiful place in paradise. I saw the Rambam and I said to the Rambam, tell me, have you seen Rabbi Yitzchak of Varki, my friend? He said, I saw him, but he left. And he goes over and he says, Avram Avinu. And he says, Avram, did you see Rabbi Yitzchak of Varki? He says, I saw him, but he left. And finally he sees the angel Gavriel. And he says to Gabriel, did you see my friend Yabrit Tzachavarki? He said, yes. And you see that forest over there? Go walk through that forest and you will see your friend at the end of the forest. So the Kotzke Rebbe walked, walked, walked. And he sees at the end of the forest, in front of a massive ocean of water, he sees Yabrit Tzachavarki at the end, edge of the beach. And he says to his friend, tell me, my dear friend, what are you doing here? And his friend tells him, this is the Valley of Tears. 
This is the place where all the tears of all the hundreds of generations of Jews, the hundreds of thousands, the millions of Jews that have cried throughout the ages, this is where God collects all their tears. And I swore that I will not move from here until God dries up all the tears that are here. We find ourselves in an unprecedented situation. With this corona, there are so many tears, tears and tears and tears. And we ask and we beseech of God to dry up these tears in this uncertain time. The tears of the corona. So there are two options facing us right now. Number one, option number one is to reopen the economy, right? Should we, should we reopen the economy? So, you know, you can't keep the world shut forever. And it says in the Torah, Adam le amal yulad. Man was created in order to work. You, you put a man in this world in order to work. You didn't put him to sit at home, to be isolated with his children, with, with, by himself, lonely the whole day long. So option one is to reopen the economy. Option number two is to keep it shut for a while longer. And the debate rages across the world. Media, protests. You know, in Israel today, my sister-in-law who works in an essential job, she's told me that for the first time today she can go back to work. Israel's been easing up the, the, the restrictions. You know, if you compare a country like Israel and Sweden, both have more or less a population of 9 or 10 million people. So you see the effects of Israel's total, total shutdown versus Sweden, which is one of the only European countries which has had restrictions in place, but nothing close to what Israel has. Israel's had about 150 deaths, Rahman al Islam, and Sweden has had about 1,500 deaths. So we've, and the average age is obviously about 80 years old, but still. So let's examine both sides of the equation. On the one hand, staying shut. So staying shut, the, 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 the theory goes, the longer we stay shut, the more of a burden this place is on the economy. Tens of millions of people have lost their jobs, and that means they can't pay basic utilities, basic bills, can't buy food. So keeping the economy shut for much longer will eventually cause a crisis bigger than the corona. And like I said before, Adam Lamalulad, a person was born to toil, to work. And number three, you know, you get cabin fever. My triplets are going through cabin fever. You know, you go, you go crazy, go, go at home the whole day long. But on the other hand, what's the option to reopen the economy of the world? There are hazards and dangers involved. If we open it, it has to be with phase, it has to be with extreme precautions. The Talmud says that if you save one life, it's as if you save the entire world. So if we are able to save one life by delaying opening of the economy, it's as if we save the entire world. So the options that are in front of us are tough. They're both extremely difficult. And therefore, there is a debate as to what to do. So today I want to explain to you what the Kabbalah behind opening the economy or remaining shut. So the truth is that we find that this question, which is a very, very powerful question, is not new at all. It's something that is not uh, innovative. It's not something new that only our generation is experiencing. This question is something that has existed forever. Because, and when we examine this question that's existed forever, we could shed light and it can help us with our current question as to whether the, to open the world or not. And I'm referring, of course, to the question of when the soul is born. When each and every one of us is born, we go through the same question as to open the economy or to keep it shut. And I'll explain. On the one hand, when every single soul is born and comes down into this world, God says, let the soul stay exactly where it is. The soul is basking, enjoying divine delicacies, enjoying spiritual pursuits. In fact, shalom to the president of South Africa, Orange Grove, Keith, nice to see you here, even from South Africa. So on the one hand, God wants to enjoy the soul wants to enjoy the world in fact we don't even understand the meaning of the word pleasure in fact it says that a person can live in this world for 70 80 100 years and a person can have every single type of pleasure that there is in this world so you can have a home in the hamptons and a penthouse in new york and a home in florida and a home in france and everywhere and a penthouse in tel aviv 
and he can have a private yacht and she can have all the diamonds and all the jewelry and all the rings and they can watch all the Broadway shows and go on all the trips and go to Vegas as much as they can and gamble and, and fill in the pleasure that you like. It says in Kabbalah that we have no understanding in the meaning of the word pleasure and one second of pleasure in the world to come is infinitely more pleasurable than all the pleasure we can possibly dream of in this world. In fact, Kabbalah compares it. Imagine you have a person who was born blind. So he, everybody around him is trying to explain to him what it means to be able to see. They explain to him to be able to see, you know, there's a world out there. There's a world that's not dark. There's a sun. There's the moon. There's the stars. There's, and you try to explain to him or her what it means to see and it's impossible. Because how could you possibly explain to a blind person what it means to see? This is what we are. We are totally blind. We don't understand the meaning of the word pleasure. True pleasure is in the Garden of Eden, is in Gan Eden. And so we have, when the soul is born, we have the dilemma. On the one hand, keep it in this divine, pleasurable place where there's no sinning. Nobody sins in the world to come in Gan Eden. In fact, the Talmud tells us a story that one of the great sages, one of the Tanoim, one time had a um, death-like experience, a clinical death. And after three days of being in a so-called coma, he woke up and his students asked him, what did you see? And he answered them, he said, Olam hafuch ra'iti, I saw an upside-down world. Explain. They said, what do you mean? He said, those people who are respected in this world, in Olam Azeh, in this physical material world, are nothing in the world to come. And those people who are nothing, nobody looks at them in this world, those people are respected in the future world. In other words, the people who are respected in this world, people who have money and fame and power, they are nothing in the world to come. And the people who are nothing in this world, who are poor, who are humble, nobody looks at them. Those are the people that are respected in the world to come. So his students told him, Olam baru ra'ita, you saw the world of truth, because that is how it truly is. So on the one hand, you have the dilemma. Keep the soul in this blissful world, or send the soul to this world to be born and to live in a physical body, to fulfill its mission here below. This is the question that God has. Keep the economy shut or reopen the world? Same question God has. Let the soul stay in Olam HaEmet, in the world of truth, where it's isolated, at home, at one with its father, with, with God, where nobody disturbs it, or reopen the economy, send it down into this world to accomplish, to do what it's meant to do. Now, the only way the soul can reach highest of heights is actually by going down into this world. As much as we talk about the greatness of the soul in paradise, there is nothing compared to what it can accomplish in this world. When the soul goes down to this world and then comes out at, on the other end, it comes out at a much, 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 much higher level than it was before it came down. And this mission is under my own terms. You know, there's a, there's a businessman, there was a businessman, Rib Gimple, Rib Gimple from Florida, who was a businessman who one time came to the Rebbe to, for Simchat Torah, to the Babacha Rebbe in Crown Heights in Brooklyn in 770. And he wasn't religious then, he was just becoming religious, but at some point during the Simchat Torah celebrations, he realized that there's bidding going on. People are bidding and money is being thrown around, so he had no idea what he's buying. He realized there's an auction and he raised up his hand, he said a thousand dollars. In those days, it was the 60s or 70s, a thousand dollars, a tremendous amount of money. So he figured a thousand dollars and the Rebbe right away said, from you, I want five thousand dollars. So he's like, oh my God, $5,000? Like that's, that's more than I have. That's a lot of money. In those days, it was a lot of money. Even today, it's a lot of money. So, but the Rebbe said, the Rebbe said $5,000. So fine, $5,000 is $5,000. So the Rebbe promised him, the Rebbe said, you'll see that God will pay you back. As it says in the Torah, Aser bishvil shetit asher, give money, tithe, so that you will become rich. 
Anyway, he goes back to Florida. He wrote the check, obviously, for $5,000, and he's waiting for the blessing to be fulfilled. One month passes, two months, and he's not making any money. Three months, four months, he's like, what did the Rebbe mean? He's like starting to have doubts in the Rebbe's words. The Rebbe told him he's going to make money, but he's not making any money. What should he do? Five months, six months, seven months, eight months, nine months. Hold on a second. Hold on. Nine months go by. And finally, on the last day of the year, the very, very, very last day, the very last day of the year, I'm just giving people the updated password over here. Finally, on the last day of the year, he gets a call from a nursing home that he had a property right near this and they wanted to buy it. And he really, really did not want to sell this property. So they said, give us a price. So he named an outrageous price, which he knew there's no way anybody in their right mind would accept this offer. And he just named it just for fun. And they said right away, yes, we want it. It was worth it for them. So he right away calls his partners. He says, should we do this? Yes. And the nursing home was desperate to buy it. And they sent the deposit that day on Erev Rosh Hashanah, the last day of the year, for $50,000. And he couldn't believe it. The Rebbe's blessing had been fulfilled. The Rebbe was right. He was wrong for doubting the Rebbe. He was so excited. Anyway, that year, two, three weeks later on Simchat Torah, he went straight back to the Rebbe. And, um, and he told the Rebbe, uh, uh, Simchat Torah, and he was waiting for the, Rebbe, for the bidding to take place and everything else. And he's bidding and he's bidding. You know, for the, the first, the first Akafa Atahareta, there was another rich man bidding. It was Rabbi Beryl Weiss from California, and he, he won it. But the second Akafa, the second Aliyah, whatever it's called, second Pasuk of something, sorry, he bid. And when, they raised, when he raised his hand, he said, Al Da'as Harebi. Whatever the Rebbe wants, that's what I'm giving. And he hoped that the Rebbe would name an exorbitant amount, like something huge. He was like secretly hoping the Rebbe would say like a million dollars and then he'd make 10 million dollars. You know, he was like, he had his wild dreams. So he, after Simchat Torah, he went for a private audience for the Rebbe and he came with a blank check and he asked the Rebbe how much to fill out. And the Rebbe told him $126. And he's like, what? $126? So the Rebbe said, last year I, I wanted you to do Uforatsta. To go out of your boundaries. I wanted to help you to give tzedakah, to live, to have belief in God. But today, now, I'm not doing it for you any, any, anymore. You have to do it on your own, on your own powers. You see, our mission in the world is to serve God on our own powers. In fact, by the way, the Rebbe in 1988, the Rebbe gave a very, very tearful sicha talk. And the Rebbe said, I have done everything in my power to bring Mashiach. I've done everything I possibly can. And those who know, the Rebbe used to talk then about Mashiach nearly every single talk. He was like crazy about Mashiach, 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 Mashiach. In 1988, Chavchet Nisan, the 28th of Nisan, the Rebbe said, I've done everything in my power to bring Mashiach. Now I turn it over to you. It's your turn. It's your chance to bring Mashiach. And perhaps now, in this orphaned generation, where we are all forced to be in isolation, we are all forced to be at home, perhaps what the Rebbe meant was, in our generation right now, every single one of us is a leader. Every single one of us is a leader to our family, to our children. We are all leaders. It's up to us. Every single one of us, on our own terms, we have to be the ones to bring Mashiach. That's what the Rebbe meant. So, you know, one time the Ruven Dunin, who was also a famous chassid of the Rebbe, a student of the Rebbe, he came in and he was having difficulty finding a shidduch, finding a, a spouse. So he, so he said to the Rebbe, why don't you just make it easy for me? Just tell me, you know who my Basharit is, you know who the girl I'm supposed to marry is? Tell me who she is, I'll marry her, why, why go through this whole process? And the Rebbe smiled at him and he said, it doesn't work that way. God wants you to go through a tough and rigorous process. It's going to be difficult for you, but eventually... By working hard, you will find on your own, you will find your spouse. In a similar vein, there was once a philanthropist. Um, you know, he was very close with Rabbi Abraham Hecht. He was a rabbi of Congregation Sharei Tzion in New York City, one of the New York's largest synagogues. So this guy was named Mr. Isaac Shalom. Isaac Shalom was a famous Syrian philanthropist. He gave a lot, a lot of money. I think even today he's pretty popular. So Rabbi Hecht was one time fundraising from him and asking him to support certain endeavors that Chabad have. So he brought him to see the Rebbe. And Mr. Isaac Shalom, you know, a Syrian Jew in a heavy accent, he comes to the Rebbe and he says, I don't understand Rebbe. Lubavitcher Rebbe, he says to him. I don't understand you. Why don't you write a letter to God asking him to send you money that Rabbi Hecht says you need to continue your good work? 
And the Rebbe smiled at him. And uh, the Rebbe said, if I would write a letter like that to God, I would ask God to make me jobless, to take my job away, to bring Mashiach. But it doesn't work that way. The, uh, the God wants us to toil, to work hard. We have to work on our own accord, on our own, to, 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 to do what's good. So on the one hand, the soul could be left at home in isolation with God over there in heaven. And on the other hand, option number two is to send the soul into this world. But it's very, very dangerous to send the soul into this world. Why is it dangerous? Because there's so many hazards. There are so many dangers for the soul. The soul could become very, very contaminated here in this world, here below. In fact, every single time a person lies or cheats, or deceives, or does any kind of sin, eats non-kosher, violates Yom Kippur, violates the Shabbat, the soul becomes contaminated, and the damage done to the soul is much, much, much worse than any damage that corona can cause the body. It's much, much more harmful than the coronavirus. Because the soul, when it becomes contaminated, not only does it destroy the Jew in this world, it destroys him or her, in the future world, in paradise, which is much worse. The coronavirus can only kill you in this world. God forbid, God forbid. Rahman al By the way, we find the same question before Moses was born. If we look at Torah, the same question that we're asking ourselves today, Moses' father had. The Torah tells, the Talmud in Sota, which we are all learning now, between Pesach and Shavuot, we learn Sota, which has 49 pages, corresponding to the 49 days between Pesach and Shavuot. So the Talmud in Sota, page 12, says the following. It says that Pharaoh made a decree to destroy all the, first, all the males, right? All the males were supposed to drown in the Nile River because his astrologers told him that the leader of the Jews will one day be born in the, in, in the water. So every, all, the, not all the firstborn were thrown into the river. So Amram, who was then the leader of the generation, by the way, Amram was one of four people who the Torah tells us, the Talmud tells us, never ever sinned in his entire life. And the only reason why he died was because of the sin of Adam, Harishon. Those four people were Binyamin, Binyamin, the son of Jacob, Amram, the father of Moses, Kilav, one of the sons of King David, and the fourth one was... Um, oh. Yishai, Yishai, David's father, King David's father. So these are the four people who never ever sinned in their life. And the only reason why they died is because of Adam's first son, Adam and Eve, introducing death into the world. So Amram decided that he's going to separate from his wife. He said, why should I bring children into this world? Why should I let them be born when they're going to die? Pharaoh is going to throw them into the Nile River. He's going to kill them. The same dilemma he had is the same dilemma we have today. The dilemma was, should I keep the children in the Garden of Eden or should I bring them into this world where they are going to die? He had that dilemma and he decided to keep them up there. He said, I'm separating from my wife. I'm not having relations with her and therefore I'm not going to bring children to the world. And because he was the leader of the generation, every single Jew in that generation did the same thing. They all separated from their wives and nobody had children anymore. So his wise daughter Miriam, who then, who at that time was six years old, I believe. She went over to her father and she told him, your decree is worse than Pharaoh. The audacity of a Jewish child, she tells him, you are worse than Pharaoh. I'm worse than Pharaoh, the guy who never sinned in his entire life. Tell me, my dear beautiful daughter, why? She says, because Pharaoh only decreed on the males, and you decreed on the males and the, and the females, because by you not allowing those souls, those precious souls to descend, to come down into this world, not only are you causing the males to die, the females also. Number two, Pharaoh only kills them in this world. Pharaoh only kills them in this world, and then they go to paradise. But you have killed them in this world and the world to come. So Amram listened to his daughter, remarried his wife. All the Jews remarried their, their spouses. And guess who was born? Moses. Moses was born, the leader who would save the Jews, who would take them out of Egypt. All because of the same dilemma. Should I have children? Should I bring children into this world where it's so harmful? Or should I keep them up there in heaven? The same story, the same dilemma was a couple of generations later where Chizkiyahu is the king of Israel. 
Chizkiah was such a righteous man that God wanted to make him Moshiach. God wanted to bring Moshiach. Chizkiah was going to be Moshiach. And Chizkiah became very ill. And the prophet Yeshaya, Yeshaya, Yeshaya Hanavi comes to visit Chizkiah and tells him, God has decreed death upon you. Why? What did I do wrong? He said, because you didn't bring children into the world. You didn't get married. As I mentioned many, many times, there are four questions that a person is asked when he or she passed away. Question number one is, Nasata venatata be'emunah, did you deal honestly in business? That is question number one. When a person comes in front of the heavenly court, were you honest in business? Question number two, Kavata itim la Torah, did you set aside times to study the Torah? Question number three, Asakta be'piriyah did you actively try to have children? Question number four, Tzipita li Yeshua, did you wait for Mashiach? So question number three, Chizkiyahu was lacking, he never had children. So he told, he explained to Yeshayahu Anavi, the reason why I didn't have children is because I saw in my divine prophecy that if I have children, they will be evil, and I don't want to bring such evil people into the world. Again, the same dilemma. Should I leave those souls in heaven where they are great and doing fine and enjoying paradise, or should I bring them into this world to live where I know they are going to be evil, where I know their souls are going to be contaminated? And that contamination is worse than the coronavirus. The same question. So what did Chizkiyahu decide? I'm sorry, so, so he decided not to have children, not to bring them into the world. Keep the economy closed. That's what he decided. Keep them up there in isolation. So Yeshayahu and Nabi told him, your thinking is wrong. You are going to die because this is the way you think. You're going to die. Because it's not up to you to decide if those children are going to be righteous or not. That's up to God. And every single person has free choice to do what he wants when he wants. So Chizkiyahu then told him, listen... I understand what you're saying, and please go away. And he, and he then made the famous prayer where he said, Even if there's a sword lying on you and if about to kill you, don't ever give up hope. So he prayed from the depths of his heart. He did tshuva, he repented, and he eventually married Yeshayahu Hanavi's daughter. He decided if there's going to be a father like me, such a great tzaddik and a, and, a, and a mother who is the daughter of Yeshayahu the prophet, then the children born out of this union will have a great chance of becoming righteous people. In the end, his child was, one of his children was Menashe, who grew up to be one of the most if, wicked, evil kings of Israel, who introduced, who brought idol worship all over Israel. Um, so that's, that's the Chizkiyahu the prophet as well. So coming back to the original question, so the question we have is, should the soul, the question that God has, should the soul come down into this world or should the soul stay up there in heaven? What should the soul do? So God then decides, I'm going to send the soul down here below. But the Gemara, and Tanya opens up with this, the famous work of Tanya of the, of the Alter Rebbe. It says, Tanya besof peregimel de Nida. We learned in a brisa in, this, in, the, in the third chapter of Nida. Mashbi'imoto tehi tzadik ve'al tehi rasha. Every soul, before it comes down into this world, we decide who is going to marry the soul. We decide how much money the soul is going to make. Everything is decided about the soul. Obviously, a person has free choice. But there's only one thing that we do not decide for the soul, whether it's going to be religious or not religious, a tzaddik or a rasha, a good man or an evil man. That is up to your free choice. However, Tanya B'Seir Perak Yimodini, Mashbi'i Moto, we make the soul swear to he tzaddik ve'al to he rasha. We make the soul swear that you are going to be righteous. What does it mean, mashbi'imoto? The explanation is masbi'imoto. We give the soul powers. We give the soul the capacity, the ability to overcome all its challenges. As we learn in Tanya chapter 14, that every single person can reach the level of what's called a benoni. What is a benoni? A benoni literally means the intermediate man. But on a deeper level, the benoni is a level that every single person can reach. And what is that level of not sinning? The benoni, if you look at Tanya chapter 14, if you look it up wherever, wherever, wherever you are, it says like this, a benoni has the bhira, 
has the free choice. The power, the capacity to overcome his temptations, even at a time where he yearns, his, his body is burning with the desire to sin. He really, really wants to sin. I want to sin. I want to sin. Please, let me sin. You are able to say those magic words of no. You are able to control yourself. A person says, oh, I can't, I can't control myself, I, I need to sin and fill in the blank, whatever your sin is. Tanya chapter 14 teaches us that every single one of us has the ability, has the capacity to control oneself. Why? Because when God had that dilemma of to reopen the world or to keep it shut, to keep the soul up there, that God decided to reopen the world, God decided to send the soul down here below, God decided, God empowered, masbi'im, he empowered the soul to succeed, to thrive, to fulfill its mission. God says, I know it's tough. I know in every single time you sin, you're going to contaminate the soul in this world and the next world. But you can do it. I have full faith in you. You can do it. And therefore God reopens the world and therefore God sends the soul down here below. And therefore God said to Chizkiyahu, you have children. And therefore Amram said, I'm going to introduce children into the world. I'm going to have them because that's what God wants. You know, they tell the story of um, the Sasov Rebbe, famous Moshe Leib of Sasov. He was a young child when he was orphaned from his father and his mother sent him to live with the Tzaddik Reb Shmelke of Nikolsburg. So as a young child, he grew up and he was learning Torah with Reb Shmelke of Nikolsburg. And one time they were eating a meal and the wife, the Rebetzin, the wife of Reb Shmelke Nikolsburg, she was going to wash her hands for Hamotzi. And she took off her ring, because when you wash, you take off your ring, so you can wash your hands without a chatzitza, what's called. And the local town thief, the local ganaf, came in through the back door. He immediately noticed the ring on, on the rabbits and that it was off, very expensive ring. And he grabbed it, he stole it, and he ran off. And because the rabbits had already said the blessing, al netilat yadayim, she couldn't speak. So she was like, ah! Oh! She quickly grabbed the piece of bread, said, I lechem in Aretz, and then she told everybody what happened. But by that time, the Ganef was already on the streets. So Reb Shmelka of Nikolsburg told Reb Moshe Leib, a young child, and he said, listen, you're young, you can catch up to the thief. Run after him, and when you get to him, tell him that I give him the ring as a present. I totally give him the ring as a present, but remember, don't sell the ring for less than 100 coins. That's what it's worth. Tremendous amount of money, 100 coins, don't sell it for less than that. So this, uh, this Moshe Leib guy, young kid, runs to the Ganef, he catches up to him. And when he catches up to him, the thief thinks, oh, this guy's going to reprimand me, he's going to tell me something nasty. He may even try to beat me up and snatch the ring from me. But no, what does he say? He says, my Rebbe told me to tell you the ring is a gift, but please don't sell it for less than 100 coins. And the thief was like shocked. He says, I feel so bad. Yeah, here's the ring back. And Moshe Leib told him, I know my Rebbe, and I know that he doesn't utter any word in vain. If he said, keep it, then it means keep it. He, he meant it with all his heart, keep it, but don't sell it for less than 100 coins. So the thief said, I feel terrible now. What do you recommend I do with the money? So the little boy told him, I think you should give the money to widows and orphans and give it. You'll feel good about it. And that's what the thief did. He sold the coin, he sold the ring for 100 coins, and he gave tzedakah for the first time in his life. He gave widows and orphans money, and he felt so good about it. He felt incredible about it. That he decided he wants that feeling again. So instead of making a living by stealing, by being the local thief, he decided to transform his life, and he became a person who has a job. He had a job now, and he was able to give more tzedakah, and he felt so good about it. So Reb Shmelka of Nikolsburg was able to transform this person who had this tremendous temptation to steal. He wanted to steal, he wanted to steal, he wanted to steal. Transform that temptation to a person who gives. One of the greatest pleasures in this world is from giving. He was able to take that temptation and transform him. And we are all able to do that. Why? Because our brain rules over the heart. God created the soul. When he put that soul into this world and he told it, he empowered the soul to be able to persevere and survive, he put in the brain rules over the heart. The famous chassid of the Alter Rebbe of Moshe Meislish, you know, when Napoleon was fighting against the Tsar, 
So many rabbis were in favor of, the, of Napoleon because he expressed equality for all Jews. The Baal Hatanya, the Alter Rebbe, was a firm, staunch supporter of, um, uh, of, of the Tsar because he felt that even though even though Napoleon expressed equality, but really he's deep, deep down what he wants to do is assimilate all the Jews. So he sent his student, Reb Moshe Meislish, to spy on the French. So Reb Moshe Meislish was a very talented individual. He was very charismatic and he knew a lot of languages. So he befriended the generals. He became very friendly with them until they trusted him completely. And he used to take their plans and give it over to, to, the, to the Russians. And eventually, Napoleon and the generals realize there's a spy amongst them because every single time they make a plan, it's thwarted, but they never knew who it was. So they came up with a super, super secret plan, and Napoleon told his top three generals, do not discuss this with anybody because there's a spy amongst us. So the top three generals were talking about it with Moshe Meislish in the room because they didn't even have a suspicion about him because he was so, like, it was so charismatic, they didn't suspect him at all. So Reb Moshe Meislish is there in the room, and in the middle of the meeting, Napoleon walks in. And Napoleon had never met Moshe Meisler. He didn't know who it was. So right away he goes over to this person. He says, this is a spy. You, you, Moshe, you're the spy. And right away he takes his hand, puts it on Reb Moshe's heart. And he says, you're the spy. And he was watching and to feel if his heart would move fast, like somebody who's caught in the act or somebody who's moving slowly. And calmly Reb Moshe replied to Napoleon, I'm not the spy. Your generals have brought me in here to help them. I'm, I'm a translator for them because I know so many languages, but I'm not a spy. And his heart was beating as normal, and Napoleon believed him. And later on, when he told his fellow Hasidim the story, he said to them, the alphabet of Hasidut of Kabbalah saved my life. The number one rule, the cardinal rule, saved my life, and that is the brain rules the heart. My brain told me, be calm. My heart told me, oh my God, it's race, race, race. But my brain told me, calm down. The brain rules the heart. God gave that soul powers. The power, the ability, the capacity to overcome the heart. You know, uh, Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch Weinreb, he's a famous rabbi, he's in the OU, he's, you know, in the Orthodox Union. So in the early 70s, he was having a midlife crisis. He didn't know what to do. He didn't know where to go. He didn't know what to approach. He, he just didn't know what to do. So somebody, he wasn't a Hasidic Jew, but he, somebody told him about the Lubavitcher Rebbe, so he called up the Rebbe's office to discuss his dilemma, to discuss his problems. The Rebbe's secretary answers the phone um, with, hello, who's this? So Rabbi Weinberg started to relate his story. You know, I'm, a, I'm having a problem, I'm a Jew, I'm having a problem, I have a midlife crisis, I don't know which direction to pursue in life, to become more in the rabbinate, to become a psychologist, like what, what to pursue. And in the middle of the conversation, the Rebbe picks up the, like the phone, he hears the Rebbe on the other line, and the Rebbe says, who is this? So he said, a Yid from Maryland, a Jew from Ma Maryland. He didn't say his name, a Jew from Mar Maryland. So he then told the secretary his questions, which he'd like to discuss with the Rebbe, about his career, about his faith, questions that have been bothering him for a long time. So he hears the secretary paraphrasing in Yiddish what his question was for, from the Rebbe. And then he hears the Rebbe respond in Yiddish, tell him that there's a Jew in Maryland whose name is Weinreb and he should consult with him. And the secretary asked him, did you hear what the Rebbe said? And I was shocked, he said. I was shocked. I never told anybody who, what my name is. I never said my name is Weinreb. And I said a Jew from Maryland. So the secretary asked me, did I hear what the Rebbe said? And I said, no, because I just wanted to hear if, if, if that's what's going on. So the secretary said, the Rebbe said, there's a Jew in, in Maryland. His name's Weinreb. You should consult with him. So I was shocked. I said to the secretary, but my name is Weinreb. I'm Weinreb. So the secretary tells to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe's words were, if so, then you should know that sometimes in order to resolve your problems, you need to speak to yourself. Sometimes the deepest solutions are within oneself. You see, the soul, when it came down to this world, was empowered, was given the power, the capacity, the ability to overcome all hurdles and all obstacles. All you need to do is search, probe within yourself, and you can, says the Rebbe, figure out all those problems. By the way, the same issue, the same question we're having now, and I'm not going to delve into it, is with marriage. 
A person is single, a boy, girl, I'm, I'm living comfortably, I'm having a great life, I'm doing my own laundry, I have my own job, I have my own business, I have my own career, why should I get married? I want to stay in solitude, I want to stay isolated. Or should I get married? Should I live with somebody? Should I go into this world? Should I enter into this world? So analyzing marriage will take a whole sheer unto itself. I'm not going to get into that now. But it's the same exact idea that we're discussing now. And where did I get this idea from? This week's Parsha. By the way, this week's Parsha is the first time we talk about quarantine because it talks about leprosy and the leper. But the Parsha says something fascinating. The Parsha says, Isha ki tazria. It talks about a woman giving birth. Isha, a woman, when she gives birth. So if she gives birth to a male, if she gives birth to a female, she, 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 she needs to bring this sacrifice or that sacrifice. But here's what the Kabbalah explains. Isha, a woman, refers to the soul. Isha, a soul, what does it want? It wants to go up to heaven. It wants to cleave to its source of Ish. Her desire is to be with her husband, with God. So the soul is burning with the desire to go up to remain shut from this world, to go out of this world. But what does it say? Isha ki tazria. Tazria, where does the birth take place? In this world. Where does the soul, where is the soul able to accomplish its mission? Where is the soul able to fulfill its duty, its purpose? In this world. So even though it wants to, on the one hand, go up, no, that's not the purpose. It can only fulfill its lifelong mission by being in this world. And the same thing is with the corona and our current dilemma. Eventually, we're going to have to reopen this world. If it's going to be gradually, if it's going to be in steps, if it's going to be in stages, we're going to have to reopen this world because the world cannot remain in isolation forever. The effects and the results of being in isolation forever is going to be catastrophic and much worse than the corona. But obviously, it's going to have to be gradual with the correct precautions and with the correct hand sanitations and breathing tubes and everything else and testing, etc., etc., but ultimately, the final answer is obviously Mashiach. You know, there's, in 1944, there was a woman by the name of Mrs. Shuei. Actually, her son is a, rabbi, a prominent rabbi in Crown Heights. He has the corona. He should have a refuah shleima. Um, so in 1944, Mrs. Shuei's husband passed away from hunger. She was living in Russia. And she was left alone with her three boys, Baruch Shalom, Isaac, and Yankel. So she didn't know what to do with them. There was no Torah academies, Torah yeshivot in the place where she was. So she sent Baruch Shalom and Isaac, the young, older boys, she sent them to Samarkand, which was far away in Uzbekistan. But there, there was an academy, a shiva of learning Torah. So she sent them over there. But the youngest one was too young. So she kept him with him until a year or two later. He also needed to go away. So with tears in her eyes, she told her son, Yankel, you, you, I'm also going to put you on a train and she's got him a ride, so to speak, with a certain chassid who was going then as well. And she said, you should go over there. And um, her son really was difficult for him. He was a young child and he understood the dilemma. And he told her, mother, I do not want to leave you. And his mother looked him in the eye and she said, I promise you, I swear to you, I will come as soon as I can. I will come join you in Uzbekistan. And they embraced. The uncle went off to Yeshiva. A couple of months later, this rabbit's in Shrey, she took the train and she went to Uzbekistan. And she comes off the train in Uzbekistan and who does she see? Her son, her child, Yankel, is at the train station. So she says to him, how did you know I was coming today? There's no Facebook, there's no Instagram, no Telegrams. How did you know I was coming today? So he looks at her and he says, mother, you promised me you will come. So each and every day I come to the train station to see if you have arrived. Hashem has promised us Moshiach. The Lubavitcher Rebbe said countless, countless times that we are the last generation of the exile and the first generation of Moshiach. We are the generation that will witness Moshiach. Every day it's our dream that he will come. Every day in our davening we say, we pray to you God that Moshiach should come now. We want him now. And when Moshiach comes, it will finally end the coronavirus a pandemic forever and ever. That's the end of the shir. Um, I'm going to stay on Z.